Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Howard Soons, author of A New Rock Music History 27, A History of the 27 Club. Stick around, because if you believe in rock and roll heaven, oh man, well you know they got a hell of a band. I'm sorry for that pun, I can't believe I said it, but I'm going there. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience that includes Billy Joel, Roger Daltrey, and Pete Townsend in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. There are a number of ways to approach Howard Soon's new book, 27, A History of the 27 Club, which investigates the deaths of rock and roll music legends Brian Jones, founder of the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jimmy, Jim Morrison of The Doors, Nirvana's Kurt Cobain, and Amy Winehouse. What they all shared in common is the age at which they died, more or less at their own hands, 27. You could say they were all artistic geniuses who were either misunderstood by their contemporaries or ill-equipped to handle the sudden fame and fortune thrust upon them at a young age. Or, you could say, less sympathetically, that they were all weak-minded, pathetic human beings who should have sucked up their misery, shown some backbone, and enjoyed their gifts. Either way, British journalist soon says there is something about these six, collectively, that bears examination and consideration. Now, we can argue about the relative talents of the group. Personally, I'm not sure Brian Jones or Amy Winehouse are the equivalent in influence and creativity to Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, or Kurt Cobain. And once the pattern was established by the first four, Jones, Hendrix, Joplin, and Morrison, did Cobain and Winehouse simply aspire to be considered as great as them by dying at the same age? Well, I assume that the author of 27, returning to this show for the first time since he was here to talk about his Paul McCartney bio, Fab, has some strong opinions on this and is dying for me to shut up and let him speak. Howard Soons, welcome back to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. Good to see you. Thank Um, you, and you. uh, Howard, it seems like there are at least, if not many more, but at least two main challenges to writing this book. Uh, One is confirming that there were were some connections between the six musicians upon whom you focused, and then making sense of all the bullshit already written about them by friends, family, uh, employees, and alleged confidants. Yeah, well, um, I was quite surprised by how many connections there were. I wasn't really expecting there to be such so many connections. Um, And certainly um, there there is a mountain of bullshit, as you put it, written about these people, which is fairly easy to debunk or shovel aside because it's so ridiculous. But nevertheless, people know about the bullshit first and foremost, which is one of the dismaying uh, facts of uh, modern life. Uh, you know, they say that, they used to, I used to be a journalist, I'm not anymore, but they used to say a lie has gone right round the world before the, the truth has got his boots on. <laughs> and that's certainly true of the 27s. Uh, I, the the book in particular that I noticed that you rip and rip repeatedly is Mitch Winehouse's uh, memoir about his daughter Amy. Uh, was there anything at all useful in it? it? I got the sense that there wasn't. 
Oh, no, I th no, I think there's a lot that's useful in it. And I think um, in many ways it's an authentic account of his his take on it. But the man is, an, is egocentric in the extreme. It's all about me, me, me. You wouldn't really know that Amy had a family other than her father. Mm. And it's a man who has a sort of tunnel vision. So it's a very particular take on Amy from the point of view of a man who has a, a huge ego and thinks he himself is a celebrity, um, which is ridiculous, uh, really. But in fact, there are harrowing passages in the book. I'm not quite sure if he knows how harrowing it is to describe the day when he came in and found his daughter dead drunk on the kitchen floor, for instance. So there's plenty of good stuff in it, but it's, it's, it's from a very particular point of view. It seemed like, uh, well, and, and the way you describe it as being very self-involved and probably a little narcissistic as well, I'm, I'm going to guess, that actually sounds like it that could describe Amy as well and maybe suggest where s some of that behavior came from in her. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I mean, certainly, of course, you know, she, she was, I think, a very great artist, contrary to your introduction. I think she was a very great artist, a very great songwriter. I, I don't think Americans give enough credit for that. And she wrote about herself and about her unhappy life, as so many great rock and roll stars do. Um, and I guess, you know, having an unhappy life gives you something to write about. So in a sense, as I say in the book, um, the 27s should be grateful to their parents, amongst others, for giving them a rocky start in life, because without that rocky start in life, they wouldn't have so much to write about. Mm. Well, all right, let's talk about Amy and, and Brian Jones. And, and, you know, it's funny, it occurred to me, after I wrote that introduction, and I, I stuck with it nonetheless, that they were the two uh, Brits in the group, which was not, yeah. uh, it wasn't uh, directed at the fact that they were British. I just thought, no, m sure. I mean, the greatest bit of fame for the Rolling Stones really happened after Brian, unfortunately, passed, and Brian left yeah, the group. Yeah. Uh, he was instrumental in there being a Rolling Stones, but I, my reading of history, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I completely defer to you on this, um, is that, you know, being present at the birth is not the same as creating the, the monstrous uh, legacy and the, all of that music that came to be known as, you know, uh, Jagger Richards more than Brian Jones. And then with Amy, I, I would agree. I mean, I think she had a phenomenal voice. Uh, and I think that because she passed so young and because of all of her uh, addiction issues and health issues, she did not spend time in the United States, really, uh, other than, I guess, maybe once, uh, maybe twice. And uh, so we didn't have a chance to get to know her and see the talent. Um, you know, can you, can, you, can you make the case for Brian Jones? No, not really. Oh. I mean, I, I, think, <laughs> I think he was an also-ran. Um, he just happened to be the guy who founded the Rolling Stones. But the Rolling Stones story is much bigger than Brian Jones. And he's left in the in its. He's a footnote in the early days. He's a bit more than a footnote. That's unfair. But he's certainly not as significant as Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. And I would say that the Rolling Stones only really became really good after he died. You know, the Rolling Stones were really good in the late sixties, early seventies. That's when they really hit their stride. Um, and he was. He wasn't part of that. So I don't think he was. A, he was. Um, he's not the equal of the other six artistically. And he was a very unpleasant person. Mm. He was a deeply unpleasant, violent, neurotic, um, completely irresponsible. They were all irresponsible, but I mean, Brian was so irresponsible. He had um, two sons by two different women and gave them the same name yeah. because he just apparently, you know, either he couldn't remember that he already had one son called Julian, so he had another one called Julian by another woman, or he was just so egocentric that he thought, you know, I'm going to begat um, a series of Julians, Julian the first, Julian the second like a kind of Egyptian um, potentate. Um, but I think Amy was a much greater artist than people give her credit for. You have to really look at the lyrics on Back to Black, which for, to my mind is one of the greatest rock and roll albums of the past 20 years. It's a, it's a beautifully written, the use of language is clever, poetic, funny, um, you know, highly individual, surprising. I mean, she's a really terrific songwriter. But there's only one great album. The first album is, is not as important. And the record they put out posthumously, Lioness, is just as the, the Who uh, titled an album years ago, It's Odds and Sods. You know, forget about it. Back to Black, though, is a great album. Well, and, uh, you know, and, and that's it. Because her, her output of really great content was limited, that's why I, I had to question 
her as compared to a, a Hendrix. Or, yeah. I mean, Janis Joplin's output was a little limited, but there's still a lot more of it, I think. Yeah. I mean, um, I think Hendrix, Hendrix is the greatest artist of the six. I mean, I think Hendrix is the towering genius of the six. And then, you know, they go down from there. I personally find much of the doors rather uh, pretentious. You know, it's music for young men. It's all about uh, potentious, rather pretentious ideas. Um, and I don't really buy into lots of it. The first album was great. The last album was great, L.A. Woman. Mm -hmm. But the stuff in between gets a bit lost. I love Janis Joplin's voice. She was a great performer, but she wasn't a songwriter. Um, and I thought, I thought Nirvana made a good angry noise. And he had a kind of economy with language that worked quite well with those songs. But he wasn't Bob Dylan, you know. Mm -hmm. Kurt Cobain wasn't Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen. He wasn't really a great songwriter. So is it what? So let's talk about what binds these six together. Uh, is it is it that they they were interesting stories? I mean, from a, a writer's perspective, the, is that part well, of it? Or what are some of the things that you know you you found to kind of tie them up together? Well, the reason I the reason I did it is primarily um, the reason I wrote the book Twenty Seven is primarily because of Amy Winehouse, who died two years ago, uh, died here in London. I was I admired her, and I thought here's a here's somebody worth writing about. The fact she died at 27 gave a tragic ending to the story. But it was in the coverage of, of her death that the, the idea of the book came about because everybody referred to the 27 Club in coverage of her death, both here and in the United States and all around the world. And um, the implication was there was a curse or something supernatural that explained why Amy died at the same age as this list of other famous people down the years. And I thought, well, that's got to be nonsense. You know, there's no such thing as a curse. We don't believe in witchcraft and the supernatural. But maybe there is some kind of link between these people. And it's certainly not the bullshit conspiracy theory link. So we can debunk that. That'll be interesting to do. But apart from debunking that, let's find out actually if there's anything significant that explains why they all died young. And another important point is, is it at all unusual to die at 27 in the music business? Well, that's also a separate thing that I address very early on in the book, because you have to know that before you get on to the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. You have a, 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 an appendix of 50 uh, people yeah. uh, in the industry. And as I look through the list, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, the level of significance of some of them kind of drops off significantly there's a hand yeah, yeah. there's a handful i think you could have made a case for maybe expanding the six to ten perhaps yeah. uh, well robert johnson and people yep. I, I did a survey of three thousand people who died over a hundred years who who were people who were in the music business who were well known enough to get obituaries in the paper for instance or to be in you know the the, the encyclopedia of popular music um, and, uh, and then I did a graph, and I just did a graph of at what ages they died, and I found 50 at 27. Um, now, some of them are borderline. Are they well known enough to be in you know, the list? That's a subjective thing. And I think because of the magnetism of the 27 Club, the tendency is to put people in it who otherwise you would ignore. So there are some marginal people. But I, I, I try to trim the really marginal ones, the really obscure ones. And, there are, and most of the people in, there, in that list have some significance. And there's some big names, Robert Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, Gary Thane, um, Al Wilson of Canned Heat. There's plenty of well-known people. Um, the guy from Badfinger um, and the guy from The Grateful Dead, of course, the keyboardist. So there's some, well, Yeah, Big Pen, well-known people. Um, but 50, actually, there is a spike. I was surprised there is a substantial spike in numbers. Um, at, in that early part of the graph, 27 does stand out. And that's, you know, one can d debate why that is. Um, uh, Robert Johnson, I thought, was the one for sure that uh, it could have could have been made it seven easily but of course yeah. there's such a difference in time it's like 50 yeah. 40 40 years time but certainly yeah. one of the most interesting music stories sure um, yeah you're right i mean it's, it's but for a book you've got to try to create something that has a sort of cohesion to it and i couldn't quite and the others are basically rock and roll stars slash pop stars mm -hmm. and he is not quite that so it, it it made more sense to deal with the people who I guess Joe Public understands and knows to be in the 27 Club. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about cause of death with uh, the group. Um, I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you know, that you can either be very sympathetic to them as, you know, misunderstood artists, 
or you can be kind of cold-hearted about it and be like, hey, you know, they should have, you know, there are people who don't have any respect for mental illness, for example, who would say, just suck it up, get through it, come on. Instead, you know, this group largely went out with uh, drugs, alcohol, um, or drugs and alcohol that led to, in Kurt Cobain's uh, case, uh, you know, the gun. Um, <coughs> uh, does it's drug abuse, alcohol abuse, any of that? Is it is it more or less sympathetic than if they had died in a car accident at twenty seven? Uh, I don't know if it's sympathetic or not. I mean, I don't think the cause of death is why we have sympathy for them. We have sympathy for them because we get to understand them during the course of the book, and we get to understand them as human beings. And significantly, we go back to childhood, and we find that the problems started in childhood. So drink and drugs were way down the line of problems. Um, problems started with mum and dad, difficult relationships with parents, um, often divorce. You know, Kurt Cobain put his finger on his parents' divorce as the absolute turning point in his life. And then I was surprised to find that the same thing happened with Amy and with um, Jimi Hendrix. And indeed, they all had difficult relationships with their parents. Um, and then they become these sort of disturbed, um, unhappy teenagers, um, trouble at school, you know, rebelliousness, of course, they're also very intelligent, talented people, um, and the drinking and the drug taking starts at school. But all of this is way before they pick up, a, they, they become well known. Um, so there's a lot of background, and I think in the background, we get to know them and, and we get to, uh, to understand them as people and therefore we have sympathy with them. Of all of them, G uh, Brian Jones is the least likable, but I would say all the rest of them are likable people. Indeed, I would say that Amy is absolutely lovable and, I, and one got to feel some sympathy and empathy for you know, Jim Morrison, certainly, and uh, Kurt Cobain. Um, I mean, you know, Part of the, the book is about death. It's, I mean, the second part of the book is all about death. It's about those last days that lead up to death. And we see them all facing death. And we can think of death with a capital D. Um, and we've all got to face that. You know, we're all going to come up to that. And we, I'm sure we all think about it some of the time or some more than others. But, you know, as, we, as you look at their lives, you tend to reflect upon your own life, you know, and you can see where one can make mistakes and how you know, a road can lead to death quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and how others, rest of us, we live longer, but we're all going to face up to it in the end. And um, and I found that very interesting, intellectually interesting. Um, I'm thinking uh, Kurt Cobain was probably the one of the six who was actually still married at the time that he died. Uh, uh, was Amy ever actually divorced or was she just yeah. separated? She was, okay. So she was oh. only, he was the only one who was married. I, I was thinking, uh, interesting, because uh, reading... And I knew a little more about Cobain, I guess, uh, but in, in reading the book, it seemed like, uh, I mean, I've always had the sense that while, while Courtney Love is probably kind of a knucklehead and pretty flighty, in his life, she actually provided him with some grounding up most of the time. Uh, and it, 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 even though it seemed like the path that he was on to hurt himself eventually, he was probably on that path in any case, but she's the one who wanted to be married. She's the one who wanted to have a kid. She had some logic and you know she's kind of continued over the years to be yeah. kind of up and down and you know there's, there's... well she, she's the stronger character she's not a likable person right but she certainly isn't a murderess as she's often being portrayed i think that's a grotesque libel frankly and a complete fantasy she's not likable she's not sympathetic but she is a stronger person evidently psychologically stronger than he was and that's and that is true of all of them you know they were all psychologically weak people the reason they all died, you know, apart from one of the reasons they all died, and people like Mick Jagger have survived to, a, to, to old age, is that people like Mick Jagger are confident, strong, together people, uh, you know, and who have enjoyed their careers. Um, but these people didn't enjoy their careers. They were unhappy, messed up people. Um, that's, the, that's the big difference. Well, let's talk about family for a second. Uh, you mentioned Jagger. It made me think of that. Um, you talk about the family issues for each of them. Uh, I know, uh, having a teenager, I don't know if you have, have children, I know a lot of people, when we are teenagers, for example, we we hate everyone, we think everyone hates us, everyone's abusing yeah. us, they treat us poorly. You know, we, if we survive, uh, we come to realize that 
you know, someone had to be around to say no to certain things and someone sure. had to be there to kind of bring you down to earth. Do you think in the case of the six, uh, because they all had family issues uh, for yeah. the most part, do you think that uh, any of them misinterpreted their family's concern or the way they were handled? I mean, certainly in Morrison's case, I mean, his dad was military and it just seemed to be a giant mm -hmm. asshole. But, I mean, that's its perspective, I guess. Did, did you get the sense that any of these families actually treated their kid the way they should that maybe you know i don't know well i i'm i'm sure they did their best i think in life we all do our best but in many ways and, and some of them did a better job than others but there were problems with all of them and of course other kids you know would have survived all of this it depends i guess on your intrinsic makeup you know your development you know, very early on um you know jimmy hendrix's father was a drunk um, and his mother was a borderline prostitute. Uh, Jim Morrison, something happened in Jim Morrison's childhood that is hard to put one's finger, finger on, but he developed an absolute loathing of his parents. Mm. He refused to see them, speak to them, from the minute he left home to when he became, when he, when he became well known. Amy's dad left home for a younger woman at a, at a sort of crucial time in her development. Um, Kurt's parents broke up acrimoniously. He blamed himself for it, as kids often do in divorces. Um, Brian Jones's parents did their best, but um, there seemed to be, you know, a great deal of friction in the family home. Um, but of course, you know, these people often have siblings who have gone on to lead apparently happy lives. So uh, we can't blame the parents entirely, but it is a recurring theme. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting in that regard. Um, made me think a lot about family and, and yeah, you know, uh, maybe maybe more counseling. Of course, the era too, for those who who died in the late '60s and early '70s, it was before everybody got counseling for everything, and you know, again, it was just kind of that hey, suck it up kind of era, as opposed to you know, uh, needing mental health issues for so many people. Um, is there is there any other age? I mean, you 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 graphed three thousand uh, deaths over that period yeah. of time. Is there any other age that was significant uh, for the number of deaths? Or oh yeah, I mean there there's a graph in the early part of the book where you can see, and of course the graph goes up. It's like a humpback, you know, it goes up and it goes down. And the peak is actually sixty one because of course most people die in you know in in late middle age slash old age. Um, uh, but in the early part of the graph, there are various spiky points in the 30s. But, but in that very early period, 50 does stand out. Um, now, that may well be because it, the phenomenon has been so much written about that every time any musician dies age 27, they're immediately identified and, and included in the club. It's also, you know, to a large extent, a coincidence. It just so happened that a series of very well-known people, especially in the 60s, died at the same age. Mm. Um, and that's when it sort of became a phenomenon. So the, J Jimi Hendrix dying, and then two weeks later, Janis Joplin dying at the same age, and two Js, as was remarked upon at the time, and then Jim Morrison, another J, not, not long afterwards. Um, this kind of made people think, you know, far out, man, something weird's happening. But what we find is that something weird isn't happening, but something desperately sad and very real is happening, and that is that unhappy people are getting into the music business, getting famous overnight, and it's going massively to their head. They're surrounded by flaky company. Uh, they're abusing drink and drugs, and they develop what I really believe is a sort of death wish. Mm. We see with the six that they all really wanted. They didn't want to live. You know, They sort of gave up on life. Uh, at some point early on, which is really a um, hard thing to get your head around because they're so young, but there's a sort of weariness to them all, uh, which is quite remarkable, I think. Um, you know, I, I couldn't recall that I had read before, uh, and probably maybe I did or I just had passed over it, um, <clears throat> that uh, Jimmy and Janice had had an affair of sorts. And well, apparently. We don't really know, but it's okay. kind of mentioned, so it's mentioned in the book, yeah. Do you think that that do you think that that had an impact on her? Besides, I mean, you have that great quote from her where she's called for comment by a journalist and about his death, and she says, yeah. "I wonder what they'll write about me." Uh, yeah. Do you think yeah. that she was all her her path was accelerated because he died, or do you think it was just coincidental? I I, just, I, I think they they were both screwing around so much they just screwed anything that they could on legs really, um, and. Um, and you know it's the egotism of youth and 
all these people, of course, are egocentric because they're performers. So it's all me, me, me. It's all me, me, me. So I don't think. Um, and of course, it's a very. It was a very unhealthy time. It was a time, as we see in the book, a time of massive drug use and experimentation and a great deal of ignorance. Um, people not really realizing that you could overdose in different ways. Although that doesn't really tell you the whole story because someone like Janice, for instance, had a whole series of overdoses and was told by her doctor, you know, one of these days you're going to have an overdose and die, Janice, unless you stop using heroin. So don't delude yourself. And the same is true of Amy Winehouse. You know, she had a series of drink-induced seizures that ended up in, uh, she actually was in hospital as a result. And the doctors told her repeatedly, if you keep on drinking like this, you may die. And yet she chose to ignore that advice. And that's where the sort of the death wish, the suicidal uh, feeling comes into play, I think. You have a great description in the book uh, as you're closing in on Jimi Hendrix's death, or maybe it was right after, I, I, I can't exactly place it, you'll know, where you talk about how he would just take, you know, like handfuls of these drugs. And I, that I thought about had, had to do with, I, I wondered if that had something to do with the lack of education in that, uh, you know, as you said, I mean, his dad was a drunk, his mom was a borderline uh, prostitute. Uh, well, that was Jimi Hendrix. I think you said Morrison. I'm yeah, sorry. That, I'm sorry. I meant, I meant, I meant Hendrix. I'm yeah, sorry. Hendrix. Jim, yeah, Jimmy. Fitz, or Hendrix says he would take anything. He was indiscriminate and he would just take anything. And so quantity didn't matter to him either. He would just pop them. Yeah. yeah. He was just, but, she, but there's a kind of recklessness about that that is, you know, on verging on very dangerous living. You know, you, it's one thing just to be reckless and not really know what you're doing. But to take nine, when he died, he, he took 18 times uh, the dosage of a sleeping tablet that would have put him asleep all night on top of booze, you right. know, on top of booze. So, it's you know, it's no uh, Kel surprise that he pegs out. Um, and you, in the back of his mind, he must have known to some extent how dangerous this behavior was. Uh, let's talk, uh, before we have to wrap up, a little bit about the actual uh, writing of a, a book like this, or, or Fab, for that matter, your uh, Paul McCartney uh, biography. Uh, people pick it up and they see the book, and it's, you know, 300 pages, roughly. And a lot of books look the same in that regard. But when you open it up, and this is something, you know, as a writer myself, I was interested in, you list dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews that you did for this book, and then each chapter has, uh, there's, there's annotations in the back. How long does it take to write a book like this? Uh, about two years, roughly. Um, um, two years from having the idea to the book being in the shops and doing things like this to, to promote it. Um, and about half and half is research and writing. And I, I tend to do a lot of research, a lot of original research. So I go everywhere mm -hmm. and I interview everyone I can. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring the story alive. So you're trying to kind of get a handle on who Jim, Jim Morrison was. And if you went, if you go to where Jim Morrison died and where he lived and you meet his ex-girlfriends and his buddies and you tend, you start to get an idea of who the man was. Um, and so I do a lot of original research, which is very time consuming and very expensive mm. um, and makes a book like this expensive to do and so you need to get lots of money from the publishers so it all becomes quite a major uh, performance but it does mean that if you if you can get it right you can spend enough time so rather than doing quick books that are shoddily researched I do books over two years that are better researched but take more time but of course you know I'm not I don't have the um, the accolade for this I mean Mark Lewison just spent 10 years writing his his Beatles book mm. um, I, you know, I think that's, and I, and I admire that, but although I think to some extent, if you're not careful, you can verge upon the obsessive, you know, uh, you've got to get the job done. It's still a job of work. And if you spend 10 years on a book, you're losing sight, I think, of what you're trying to achieve. Amen, brother. <laughs> I, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, you know, I, I, I could not spend, I think the longest I've spent on a single book was three, three years. And that was my first book. And that was because I, you know, I didn't know how to go about the research and how to put it together, and you had to learn. But I, I'd be damned if I'm going to spend, uh, you know, two years is a lot. That would be about the the extent that I would go on a book. But uh, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's a it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, I gather you're in your office right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any um, anything? I've got my nineteen my 1953 uh, Remington typewriter behind me. And when was the last time you actually used that to write a book? 
uh, well, I don't use it to write books, but I use it. I used it yesterday. I use it for writing lists and typing envelopes. I love it. Interesting. All right. And I was then the reason I ask about the office. I like to take advantage of <clears throat> the video. Is there anything on your desk? Uh, any me mementos of any sort you might like to share that we would not sure. see? See if we were doing audio. Well, I've got my a poster for Fab behind me. You can probably see mm -hmm. that. Yep. Uh, my my grandfather, my grandfather was a was in the First World War, and uh, that's his one of his war. That's one of his medals. Wow. And um, he was a very lovely guy. He was born in 1898, so he was a Victorian, and he lived into his 90s. And he was, you know, a link to. You know, he was in the First World War, um, and, um, and so I have, I have his medals behind me in a little case. Um, and before he, he joined the, um, when he, before he went off to, f to to fight the Hun in Germany, he was a post office dispatch rider, and this was his post office whistle. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. GPO, like about not, circa 1914. Wow. Uh, he was a telegraph, a telegraph boy. So that was my granddad, um, Davis. That looks to be uh, in great condition, too. Well, it's indestructible, this whistle. I mean, it, it's about 100 years old. And yeah. I don't know why you need a whistle if you're a post postman, but he had one. Maybe let people know that the post was in? I don't know. I, I thought maybe if someone was trying to rob him, he'd blow it. Yeah, that could probably work as well. It, nowadays, it's it sounds more like uh, what you might just what some people might describe as a rape whistle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is my pinball where I sort of pin various things and. Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Right, and these right. are my note. Like, when I write a book, I use notebooks like this, and I and I fill. You know, I may fill sort of ten of these for one book. Oh, I like uh, that. Yeah. So you're taking notes on the phone when you talk to people or in person uh, as opposed to just recording? Well, I take notes all the time. So also I read a great deal. So every time I read something or I see something or I meet someone or I go somewhere, I'm continuously taking notes. Um, and, you know, and that's all part of the process. Very good. Well, uh, I, I, th I thought the book was fascinating. I mean, I hope you could tell from the details that I... I you know, repeated back to you that, that caught my attention. I really enjoyed the book. Um, I, I hope people will uh, will give it a shot. And uh, uh, folks, let me let you know that you can find Howard Soon's uh, new book, 27, A History of the 27 Club. It's in great bookstores everywhere, of course, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. If you're watching the video on Mr. Media, right below the video, probably over there usually, or sometimes over here, uh, is the is the image of the book. You can click on it right now and get the book uh, from Amazon, you know, within a day. Uh, you know, maybe by the time you see this, they'll have drone delivery. You can get it in 30 minutes. You can probably download it as an ebook. Uh, Howard, uh, do you, uh, I wasn't sure. Do you have a website? Are you on Twitter or Facebook? Any of that kind of thing? Uh, I have a website. Um, you can look me up very easily. I have an unusual name and it's spelled S-O-U-N-E-S. -E There's only really one of me. So what, do you know the URL for the, for the website? Uh, it's howardsoons.com. Easy enough. And uh, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, any of that kind of thing? No. No. Okay. No. I All tried right. it. I didn't like it. Fair enough. Um, Howard, uh, pleasure uh, to have you on again. I hope you'll come back with uh, whatever you work on next. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. Thanks, Bob. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love from Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. 
My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The TechCrunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.